Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me in the locker room this afternoon. I'm Alan Locker. Today, we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of All My Children's Greg and Jenny with Greg himself, Lawrence Lau. Lawrence began his television career with appearances on such primetime classics as Happy Days, It Is Enough, and The Waltons. More recently, he's appeared on Blue Bloods, Elementary, Law and Order, Jag, and Frasier, to name a small few. Lawrence made his debut as Greg Nelson in 1981 and remained in Pine Valley until 1986. In addition to his roles on All My Children, Lawrence played Jimmy Frame on Another World, Sam Rappaport on One Life to Live, Brian Wheatley on As the World Turns. He has just finished writing his first book called Running Naked, and he is also in post-production on a short film he wrote and produced called The Long Walk Home. Let's take a quick look back in time. Please help me welcome Lawrence Lau to the locker room. Hey, Lawrence. Hi. <laughs> wow, that, that, those are some serious memories. <laughs> Do you get a flashback immediately when you see oh, that? Totally, yeah, yeah. Those are good when, times. When you hear 40 years, I mean, literally four, two, two days ago on Valentine's Day, 1984, February 14th. It was 40 years. 40 years. 40, 40 years. It's just, it's hard to digest that crazy that's, that's, that's four decades that's almost <laughs> another 10 years that'll be half a century <laughs> wow it, it yeah really, it's it kind of, actually, really, it actually really cool to see that oh there we are again it's it's kind of nuts kind of yeah, nuts it's pretty amazing yeah i mean it, it is you know i'm sure you've 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 noticed it uh you know, as the years have gone by, first of all, I know you didn't know much about soaps when your agent said, you know, all my children, you were like, what's that? Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but to, to think here we are in 2024 and, and the fans, you know, still the, the immense love of you and Kim and these two characters yeah. remains. Yeah. Yeah. Agnes Nixon, she, she created a couple of, um, a, a storyline. Uh, the, the four of us actually with Darnell and Debbie also yeah. and Kim and I, and, and uh, it was sort of unique for its time, I think. And it was so, I don't know, just so such a genuine storyline of, of young love and, and all the obstacles they had to go through uh, that uh, created a, a, I don't know, a special spot in a lot of people's hearts. That's a great way of saying it. Do you have any memories of filming the wedding yourself? Oh, uh, well, I mean, just just what you saw. I mean, you know, it was, it was everybody in the everybody in the building was there in the, in the background and in and in this in the pews and and uh, it was I, I was nervous. It was it was almost like I was getting married. But um. <laughs> yeah, I bet because yeah, I mean, everyone's there watching the two of you for sure. Yeah, yeah. But you know, with with Kim right next to me and and uh, Darnell and Debbie nearby, it was it was. And it was, it was kind of sort of like a surrogate family in a way. You know, it was it was pretty special. Did you and Kim hit it off from the get go? Yes, yes, we did. She was she had been on the show about th I think three or four months before I joined the uh, joined all my children. So she was already sort of established and, and secure, and she had made friends with everybody already. And I was so I was the new kid on the block for a while, but we we hit it off pretty quickly. Um, that's got was, that's got to feel great when you're coming into something new. Yeah, yeah, it, it did feel good, um, and it was it was it was really exciting. And working with Kim was just uh, she was so um, effervescent. She was just bubbly and happy, and 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 she had a fantastic smile. And uh, her her 
her energy was was just so um, delightful. And, and was, you shared a dressing room, I, I recall, in our last interview with with Darnell and Mark Lemura, correct? Yeah, yeah. We and we would fight for the one cot that was in there <laughs> for nap time. <laughs> for nap time, yeah. We'd get there early, you know, and and do our blocking at rehearsals, and then we'd have like a, sometimes a couple of hours to kill. So it'd be like, who can get to the cot first? You know. So funny. Yeah. You know, you, we live in a different time. You know, social media today, a couple gets married on a soap and you can see the immediate reaction or or a couple gets together and you see the immediate reaction. When mm -hmm. did it resonate for you that, that Greg and Jenny had resonated with the audience? Oh, that's a really good question. It wasn't too long. Um, I think I, I, I joined the cast in October of 81. And by March of 82, we were on the cover of magazines. Uh, we were, I had, a, Darnell and I had a, these uh, amazing photographs taken by us, by the uh, Life Magazine photographer, Benny, Barry McKinney. He was, he was like a oh, famous wow. photographer at the time. And they, these were photographs. I, I never thought I could I could look that good, and I probably never will ever again. <laughs> and <laughs> Life so, Magazine, but I, uh, Jared, a fan, just sent me this today. I mean, on the cover of TV Guide. That's right, and I think that was '82, also 1982. I'm trying um, to see if I can see that. I can't. It's too small on my screen. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure that was '82. So yeah, the storyline took off um, in '82, early '82, and, and it just kind of escalated. As the story as as the story went on, and they they put in more and more obstacles, and no, no, they they can't be separated. No, oh, Greg, please don't let Greg die, you know. Yeah. And, or somebody's going back to New York. Shoot. Yeah. It was um, it just it just escalated, you know, it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where, you know, I had to wear a disguise to walk down the street. So, yeah, like a baseball cap and sunglasses and and the up the upturned collar and getting chased down the street and, and running into restaurants and hiding in the bathroom and stuff like that. It's crazy to think back, you know, how popular soaps were in the, in, in the eighties, they really yeah. at the yeah. height of their popularity. Uh, that That's wild. You, you know, you said Kim was there when you got there. Um, were you, did Darnell, did Kim, did, you know, anyone take you under their wing to show you the ropes? You know, this is, a lot different than doing, you know, eight is enough or happy days, you know, doing yeah. soap is, uh, it, it's, 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 you know, if your storyline is hot and heavy, it's, it's, uh, it, there's a lot to do. Um, if, when, you, when your storyline is, is really clicking, um, they're, they're writing you in every day. And sometimes with, you know, 15, 16, 20 pages, some, I, I one day I had 40 pages of dialogue to do. And, um, it's just, it's just, you just kind of get used to it. And when you're doing prime time, you know, this is the thing about prime time. They pay you a lot more, but they work you a lot less. It's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, when you're doing prime time shows, you, you, you may work, you may do three to five, maybe sometimes eight pages in a day. And when you're doing daytime, when they, which most of the scripts are roughly about 85 pages, you're doing 85 pages a day. Um, so it's, it's quite different. So, Mm. We, we've had, there was a couple of um, people who uh, went from prime time to to daytime on our show. I won't name names because they're, but they were wonderful people. They the, the adjustment they had to make to yeah. shooting, you know, you know, two, three, four, five, maybe seven pages in a day, compared to the the uh, onslaught of pages you had to do for daytime. It was hard for them to like make make the adjustment many times. It, so it's, it's so true. But it's like um, a it's like, it's like a muscle though, Alan. It's like once once you kind of get into the groove of memorizing your lines, you know, it, it, it comes yeah. it gets easier and easier and easier until it's like, you know, it's like a bicep, you know, <laughs> you, get, you get strong. Yeah, exactly. You, if you step away from, you know, that free weight for a little while, the muscle goes down and then you start again and it builds up. Exactly. It, it's so true. Tony says Greg's mother was dead set against them from getting married. Um, yes. And, and another fan, KC Guy, was asking if you can talk about Natalie Ross, uh, who played your mom, Enid. Do you ever keep in touch or talk to her? 
Uh, I haven't for years. Um, uh, there was a reunion I th a while back from all the older characters, some of the older characters, including me. And I saw her, or I, or I, we texted, or somehow we communicated. And I said, "Wouldn't it be great if if Enid and Greg could come could get back together again on the show for a while?" And she said, "Oh, that would be just lovely." I think she was living with her husband out on Nantucket, someplace, or oh, beautiful, uh, someplace out there. And she had, yeah, she had found her a wonderful place to live. Um, but that was that was kind of probably fifteen years ago. Wow, we, yeah. we, we time goes by quick. But I will say that, that Natalie Ross was just a, a delight to work with. She was so warm and, and, and just a loving person. And she, she was a real pro. I mean, she did, she did her, she, she really kicked butt when it came to playing that, that character of Enid. She was so good at that. Um, yeah, so I was, fan, I, was very lucky, I was very lucky to work with her. Well, and then uh, Kim's dad, uh, Jenny's dad, was played by Gil Rogers. What do you remember? Because I uh, worked on Guiding Light, and Gil was on Guiding Light. What do you remember about Gil? I just remember he was a, a murderer, <laughs> and he tried he tried to blow us up, or uh, somehow I'm not sure how that happened, but he he's he concocted a bomb of some sort that uh, that went off, and I think it killed him instead. By mis uh, it's kind of vague in my memory, but he was a nice guy. I mean, he was a really he was a good actor. Yeah, he, he he's a great actor. What what do you remember? Some of the fans were asking about uh, when they killed, you know, when Kim decided to leave, uh, killing Jenny off. What do you remember about her death scene? Oh God, I, I well, I remember being appalled that the way she was going to go out was by being blown up on a jet ski. Um, that was that was that was really quite a unique way to go <laughs> to leave the show. Um, but uh, I remember that it was it was handled very well and we were at a location in new jersey someplace and out in the sticks up by this reservoir and um when it came time when when the uh, explosion you know took place as jenny's scooting around and out in the water going hi greg like this all of a sudden you know this huge explosion takes place and we tad and i went swimming out there to, to, to pull her back to safety and she was barely alive and and it was it was very tragic um and then of course it took about a month for her to die in the hospital <laughs> of course <laughs> we, we had many many you know uh hospital bed scenes you know yeah. praying I love that. And it took a month. yeah it took a month but uh it was it was sad i mean you know we had a really we had a really nice thing going and and i i loved working with kim she was just wonderful to work with and uh, but she had you know different things she wanted to do so she i think she went out to la right after she she her contract was up and yeah, it was and sad. that's a great I mean, thing to do when you have a steady job right yeah yeah and uh, um so it was sad that, that she was leaving out because it was, it was it was wonderful to work with her um uh, and just always enjoyed her presence um yeah, I, I think that uh, she went out to L.A. to try her hand at, at prime time, and eventually she she struck gold out there with NYPD. Yeah, you know, and, and other other successful shows. So um, yeah, it was just just it was a loss for the show, but uh, they they tried to to bring in a lookalike for, for for Greg's character, and I said I don't think that's going to work. I said that to the the associate producer or the producer. Um, I said the audience is is they're really focused on Jenny and Greg, and if you bring in somebody who's um who's a lookalike to to try to kind of keep keep the 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 images of these two going, it's you're not mm. going to fool you're not going to fool the audience. The audience is going to go. That's not Kim. Greg is not in love with 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 this new person who looks like Jenny, you know. And, and they said no, it's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to work great. Don't worry about it. And uh, they brought on a lovely actress who was who kind of looked like Kim, same color, hair, and the whole thing. And she was a lovely person, but the, the fans just were they rejected the, the whole notion of trying it, to it, make Yeah. Isn't that Go ahead. I mean the power of um 
just the power of you know what you two created and what the writers created with Greg and Jenny. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's hard to replicate something like that. Yeah. Um, when you think about you know taking on that role for five years, I think eighty six. Did I right? It was, it was about four and a half years. Four and a half years. What do you think you learned? You know, in Pine Valley, that you took everywhere else from from there. What do you think it? I mean, in terms of technique or or storyline. Yeah. Or, what? Yeah. What sort of technique? How did it help? Do you think it helped? Maybe it didn't help. Oh God. Well, I, I you know, I was still a very much a very green actor. I was. I was. I kind of skated on personality and and chutzpah. Um, but when it came to actually, you know, acting technique, I had a long, I had a lot to learn. And, uh, but um, I was surrounded by, you know, there's some really good veteran actors on that show. And I was able to watch them and, and, and try to learn, see what they were doing and how they were doing it. And, and um, one of the things I think I learned the most was just learn your lines really, really well. And then go in there and just, and just talk, try not to think too much about what you're doing, but, or just, 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 just like, like Spencer Tracy said, just don't bump into the furniture and, and hit your marks. And um, so I, I learned to try to keep it as simple as possible, you know, and, and not overthink the acting. So I don't know, stuff like that. Yeah, I love it. And I, you know, I was listening to our first interview and you, you talked about your agent, you know, talking about this role coming uh, up yeah. in New York, you'll be able to pay your rent and take classes. Did you use yeah. it as an opportunity to take classes while you were in New York? I started to, you know, and for, for the first uh, you know, uh, two or three, maybe four months, I, I hooked up with a good a good acting teacher in New York, but the storyline became so, they were working this five days a week for, for months. And, and after a while, just, I, I don't have time to, to, to learn, you know, scenes from uh, other material and 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 to and to do acting class at night so i just kind of kind of faded away and i was just you know learning from the soap uh, but it was it was pretty funny my, my, my agent said listen um abc had seen i, I had done this uh, small part in a in a, in a uh, abc tv movie called the best little girl in the world um and uh, it was about anorexia and uh, J Jody Foster had actually had actually auditioned with Jody Foster, and then the writer strike came along, and 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 they had to postpone the production of that. This was 1980, and uh, then by the time the strike was over, uh, Jody Foster had, had started her her uh, Yale University, and uh, so, so Jennifer uh, Jennifer Lee, I, I can't remember her name right now, but. Um, I worked with this this well known actress who was just wonderful. But it was about a ten minute part where I played this. Oh yeah, kind of Jennifer big... Jason Lee. Yeah, yeah. Jennifer Jason Lee. Yeah. I, I feel I, like I saw that movie. I, I, totally. It was, kind of, it was kind of big time. It was a. It was a. I, yeah. I, even Marie Saint. I, I absolutely think I saw that movie back in the day because it was a yeah. big deal. Because yeah, I, and and I so I had people talk about, about that issue. issue. I had like a 10 minute scene where I was kind of playing this big man on campus and I talked her into going out, out, out of the party and sitting in my car with me and, and I tried to get her to smoke a joint. And uh, she said, no, no, no. And I said, well, what are you, a tease? And I slammed the door on her and left her. It was, I was real a crude jerk. But ABC, <laughs> ABC back in New York had been looking to, for, the, for the, um, the, the, the actor to play the role of Greg Nelson for a couple of months, three months. And they weren't having too much success, but this the AB the, Jackie Smith, the um, the vice president of ABC Daytime, saw that ten minute role I had in that movie, and she she and her she and her daughter watched it at the same time, and they both said that's Greg. So they tracked me down. My agent said, "Listen, ABC just called. They want to know if you'd be interested in screen testing for the role of Greg Nelson." And I said, "For for what?" And they, and they said, "All my children." I said, "What's that?" And they said. It's a soap opera. I said, "Well, what do you, what, 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 what is that?" And he, he said, "It's a way to make, it's a way to make steady money. You can go to New York if you get the part. You can go to New York. You can pay your rent, and you can learn how to be an actor." So I went, "Oh, well, that sounds, that sounds good. So I'll do that, you know." And uh, so I, I mean, I really didn't know it. my elbow from from 
from an, from an atom. But it was it was it was a learning experience, and and uh, a lot unfolded over those next four and a half years. That, that, that's incredible. Um, speaking of Jenner for Jason Lee, she just was in um, the recent season of Fargo with uh, John Hamm. And oh, I got to see that. She was, she's great. She's so great in it. She's amazing. Um, yeah, yeah she, 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 she really is. Um, you, you talked in the, our last show too about your first primetime series, Paris with James Earl Jones. And My very first you, job. Yep. And asking him for an autograph. Do you still have the autograph? No, I wish I did. <laughs> I feel ter- I, I've, I've never been a collector of things. You yeah. know, my girlfriend goes, you, you never save anything. I go, I know. I think it's because I moved around so much from an early age that I never got attached to things because I, you know, I didn't, didn't want to schlump everything. I went to New York a couple of times, went to L.A. a couple of times. I went to Utah for a while. I, I hitchhiked across the country once, and I took a motorcycle ride across the country once, and I was, I did a lot of moving about. So I just, you know, but I wish I had that. It was, um, he played uh, the solo show of, of the character Paul Robeson, who was an amazing athlete, uh, in, intellect back in the 1920s. And he did this solo show called, based on the life of Paul Robeson. And um, then he did this series called Paris, where he played a detective. And I had a guest spot, my very first job. And it was December 1979, and um, and um, so I was, it was, and it was a, it was a really good role for that guest starring role for that time for me. And uh, so when there was a break, I went up to his trailer, and I remember I, I knocked on his door, which was higher than I was higher was much higher. And there were some steps that led up to it. And he opened the door and he used and he had that uh, James Earl Jones baritone voice. And it was, he said, yes, you know, I can't even imitate it. <laughs> and it, I held up my copy of the Paul Robeson solo show. And I said, would you sign this for me? And he said, well, I sure would be glad to. And he signed it and it was very nice. And I was just, it was my, it was my, it was actually the, the last autograph I ever, I ever obtained, but I'll never, never forget his kindness. He was, he was very, very kind and warm, and and that was that was my very first job. I mean, you know, to be paired up in your first job with you know James Little Jones. I mean, yeah, it's got to feel like you're you know you're on the right track. <laughs> yes, but I also watching him work and watching knowing where I was at, I had a long ways to go. <laughs> um, happy days, also with you know working yeah. side by side with Henry Winkler. Yeah. Yeah, he was. He. I have a special story, but did I tell you this special story about Henry Winkler? I don't remember. I know you talked a little about him. I don't know if I remember the story. Well, um, yeah, I, I did this guest spot on on Happy Days, and it was it was it was great. It was really you, awesome you knew spot. what Happy Days was. <laughs> well, I knew it. Yes, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I knew that. Um, but. Um, my I, my character was I was supposed to do this big man on campus again. And I was supposed to come into the, the soda shop and and go. Um, I think I'll take you to the you know, the end of the year masquerade dance. And uh, I was I was this big man on campus, o- overly confident and real you know dork also. And um, but I, during rehearsal I came in and I was so nervous. It was a live audience. And it was this was during the, this was the rehearsal of it. Um, I was so nervous when I came in through those 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 the soda shop doors. I was just too nervous to, to exude any kind of confidence whatsoever. I was I was the the opposite of confidence. And he saw that I guess. And after the rehearsal was over, he walked up to me and put his arm around my shoulder and said, "Come here, come here. Let me let me tell you something. You're going to be great. You're just you're going to be you're just going to be great when you walk in those those. Uh, I, but I got I got a suggestion for you." When you walk through those 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 doors into the soda shop, I want you to pretend like you are the sexiest man on the planet. And I went, okay, you know. And he said, you can do it, and and you'll be great. So I walked when I walked into the when we filmed it, I walked in with this big bravado attitude, and and I was so strutting, taking long, slow strides, and I finally picked Jenny Piccolo, and I said, you, we're going to the the masquerade ball together. And then I, I slowly strode out through the doors again, and 
and I, Henry, I owe that to Henry Winkler. Henry Winkler took a total nobody, I, I mean a nobody, and and had the uh, the the kindness to pull me aside and save my butt because it would have been if I left to my own devices, I probably would have been horrible. What a gift, and and what a mm -hmm. so early too in his career. I mean, that was 1980, also, or yeah. That, that, 80, 81. That no, was 80. That no, was 80. That was 82. God, I can't remember. No, that was 80, 81, I think. Wow. Well, a after All My Children, you ended up in Bay City playing Jamie Frame. And I know yep. many, Dr. many Dr. fans. Dr. Jamie Frame, yes. Yep. Many fans here today are very excited to hear about your memories. Um, do you remember your, uh, did you have to audition um, for that role? Um I was I was in Utah at the time, kind of uh, uh, rearranging my life on on a personal level, and I, and I got a call from John Weitzel, who said, "How are you doing?" I said, "I'm doing great." And he goes, "You feel like working again?" And I said, "Yeah, sure." And he goes, "Well, let, let us fly you back to New York, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll see what we can see what we can do." And so I went went back to New York and and uh, read a scene with I think I, I read a scene with John Weitzel. Uh, and he was just checking me out, see, seeing if I was like um, ready to work again. And uh, I felt great. And I was full of energy again. And, and uh, so he said, okay, all right, you'll start next week or something like that. Wow. So, That's yeah. crazy. Uh, Luther asked, would Larry agree that the writers of Another World tried to capitalize on the aura of Jenny and Greg by pairing you opposite Lisa, played by Joanna Going? That thought crossed my mind, <laughs> but um, yeah, I was kind of glad they did because Lisa was um, Joanna Going was was just wonderful. She was just a terrific person. She was great to work with. Well, let's have a fun look at that. Oh, do you have a memory? <sighs> oh, hold on. The way it's. I'm gonna do it again. Okay. Everything she dreamed of. Lisa and I are through. There will be no reconciliation. So, the way is clear for you now. Everything she longed to hear. We could be good for each other. What do you want to ask me, Jamie? Will you marry me? What do you think Vicky will do on another world? <laughs> Can you share memories of both uh, Joanna and the late Anne Heche? Um... Well, just that they were both they were both wonderful actors, um, and it, it was it was delightful to work with both of them. They were just they were just they were, they were pros. They 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 knew their work and they did their work so well. Um, it lifted my game to work with them. Um, yeah, they were I mean, they were just they were just they were just they were great colleagues to work with. And they both went on and did pretty good. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a very unfortunate about what happened to. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely agree. Absolutely very, agree. Very sad. It was very sad. Um, another fan uh, was asking. Roy was asking. Do you have memories when Douglas Watson Mac died and filming those episodes? Yeah, uh, Roy, Roy thinks that was the definitive masterclass in how to write in and honor the the memory of a legacy character, actor, and pure emotional acting from the entire cast. He said, "Yeah, yeah, that was it was so sad. It was so so unexpected and surprising. I mean, um, I just loved I loved it when I, there were scenes where I was able to be in the same room with Douglas Watson. Um, he was such a gentleman." Um, um, and I guess he, they were out in um, the Grand Canyon, and he had this just totally surprising, you know, break, uh, I think it was a heart attack. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, but he was—he um, was—he was, a, he was another, again a, just a great person. And you were out in Brooklyn twice. Oh Same yeah! Studio. First Thanks. for Another World, and then for World Turns. As the world turns, yeah. Uh, Chris Goutman called me up one day and said, "Listen, I got an idea for a storyline. It's probably gonna. It's just a, about a three three month arc. Um, would you be interested in in, um, in doing that?" And he told me a little bit about it. And I said, 
Yeah, that sounds that sounds um, sounds really interesting. So why don't you come? Why don't you come out out to my office and we'll have a little talk. So I went out to his office and we we chatted for a while and he told me the storyline. He said it would be you were going to play a man uh, who is unsure about his own sexuality. That mm -hmm. he's he's been hiding the reality from himself and from everybody that he knows that he's uh, he's actually gay, but. Um, it, it's, it's he's kept it a secret his, his his entire life and then he moves to um the town where another world takes took place as the world turns okay as world, <laughs> yeah as, yeah excuse me as the world turns and um he be, befriends um uh, what's her name again elizabeth hubbard elizabeth hubbard and, yeah and, and um he befriends her and they become very close and it gets kind of to the point where they start to feel love for each other. And unfortunately, parallel in that, my, the character I'm playing, playing, Brian Wheatley, begins to fall in love with her grandson. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real, um, it's a, it's a great story. I love it. It's a, it was a really good story and, 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 and difficult to, to, uh, accomplish, to, to, to pull it off. But I, I, it, in in my gut in my gut feeling was that the, the way the only way to make this really work is for the character of Brian to to really really truly genuinely be in love with Lucinda at the same time, not just using her as a beard or a mask mm -hmm. or a cover, but to really have strong feelings for her and at the same time strong feelings for um, the, the grandson. So which which created a a, a much richer kind of uh, drama or conflict. So uh, the, the storyline that was supposed to last three months lasted eight months. Uh, and then it ended with uh, Brian, of course, trying to kill himself by overdosing on pills. And then they, they sent him off to a mental clinic in, in Chicago. <laughs> um, but it was a good, it was a good storyline. I got those, I got a lot of, a lot of mail from people around the world actually saying, uh, I've been struggling with struggling with this dilemma my entire life and your story. So help me deal with it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was quite gratifying to know that something you, you're doing for, you know, your, your own work can affect somebody and be helpful. Yeah. Isn't that, it really is. It's incredible. The, the power of the medium. It really, it really is. Um, what, what do you remember about the late Elizabeth Hubbard? Um, it's oh, she! Oh, she, she was just a uh, a firecracker. No, 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 a, a stick of dynamite. It's not bigger than a firecracker. She was. She would say, "Larry, okay, come on, we got scenes today. Let's go into my dressing room and and, and, and turn this turn this 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 awful stuff in, into something worthwhile to do." And I go, "Oh, oh, okay." She goes, "Yeah, we'll make it. We'll make it so much better. Come on, let's." And we'd go to work every every time I worked with her. She, we would. I mean, we as soon as we were finished with the blocking rehearsal. We'd head up to her, her her dressing room and we would work the scene, and uh, it was like it was such a gift to me to work with someone so incredible. She was an amazing actress. Well, just she was just wonderful, and uh, so the fact that I got a chance to to work with her and 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 you know go face to face and back and forth with her and and then the scenes that we did it was it was it was a gift. I you know it's. I, I worked on World Turns and I love Liz and knowing how Liz has worked her entire time playing Lucinda. And this was even towards the end of the show in, in 08 or 09. And the fact that she still cared so much that she was in yeah. her dressing room with you rehearsing is a testament to how much she loved the craft of acting. It really tells you everything. Yeah, it really does. That's a really good point you just made. I mean, she she's been doing this for decades, and she still cared enough to make it better. You know, I mean, a lot, a lot of actors. I, I don't want to be, you know, crabby here, but a lot of actors will just go, "Okay, this is what I'm doing," and slide and slide by. You know, but they'd be in their room themselves, you know, uh, learning their lines, but wouldn't ask you to come in and and let's let's make it better. Not everybody. Yeah is is yeah. aiming to make it better yeah 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 so she, she, talent i mean out of every pore of that woman mm -hmm. 
<laughs> body. Before I forget, because uh, I know we moved off from another world, um, I know you are attending the 60th anniversary celebration for Another World on Saturday, May 4th. It is from 11.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. in Terrytown, New York. There'll be a welcome reception, a luncheon, question and answer hour, meet and greet, and photo ops. There is a link down below on YouTube if you are interested in attending. Again, that is May 4th. A lot of Another World uh, cast members will be there. And that's going to be fun. I mean, when was the last time you got together with uh, uh, Another World folks? I, it's, it's been a long time, <laughs> a long, long time. I, um, gosh, I can't even remember the last time I saw somebody from, from uh, those days. Uh, I can't remember. It's, yeah. it's just it's way, way too long. And with the pandemic yeah. having come in between, I think every fans and cast members are all going to be really excited to see each other. Yeah, it should be fun. It's going to be great. Yeah, How did the, weather the role of Sam Rappaport come along on One Life to Live? Oh God! Well, that was another angel, and and that flew over my 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 dim my dimming halo. Or that's <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if that works. Uh, uh, I was out in L.A. and I was starting to uh, kind of pick my career back up off off the ground again. I was starting to do some guest spots on Jag and and Frasier and 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 a few other. Um, uh, nighttime guest spots on this and that. And then I started and I did a couple of um, like four independent films. And um, so things were kind of like, you know, going well for me out in LA. And I got a call from Gary, um, Gary Tomlin. Um, Tomlin. And he said, Hey, it's, it's a, uh, it's Gary from, from uh, I'm now doing executive producing one life to live. And so I've got a role that's coming up and I thought you might be just right for it. Uh, are you interested in coming back to New York again? This happened again. So I said, sure. Sounds great. So they flew me back to New York and I had lunch with Tom um, and for about an hour. And he said, great. You start in a month. And I, I said, fantastic. So I went back to LA, packed up my stuff and flew back to New York and found a great place to live in the West Villa uh, in, in, in Hell's Kitchen. Sorry in Hell's Kitchen, and it was, which was a 20-minute walk to the studio. So you'd see me at like 6.30 in the morning walking up 9th Avenue with a script in hand, memorizing my lines and trying not to bump into people. Where where were you in Hell's Kitchen? 40, 46th between 9th and 10th. I lived on 48th between 10th and 11th. Really? Ah. Yeah. Loved it. We probably passed. We probably Pro passed prob time. probably many times. Yeah, <laughs> in that in that area, um, and, and again paired with an amazing lady, Catherine Hickland. Oh God, yeah. What a what, what a pistol. She's a she's a pistol. She was um she was great to work with. She she was a very energy. She had a lot of energy, and I always wanted to make again another actress who wanted to make the show as best as she possibly could. Um, and she was always she was always fun to work with. So, um, there, there were times when in rehearsal, when she would say to the director, my character would never say that. And they'd have these little, these many arguments about what her character would say and what her character wouldn't say. And so I'd have to just, you know, sit back and wait for this to get resolved. You know, I'd have my coffee and read my paper and go, are you ready for me, remember me yet? Not, not yet. Okay. I'm going to read my paper and have my coffee. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> that's wild. But that was, yeah, that was, was small price to pay to work with somebody as good as Catherine. Uh, the, one of the fans said they loved your chemistry with Hillary B. Smith. Oh yeah. She was great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I lucked out. I worked with a lot of really wonderful people. Make, uh, makes the, makes the job uh, a lot more interesting and fun. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for yeah. sure. And, and, you know, Jason, Shane Scott and Jessica Morris played your kids. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Was that the first time you had kids on a soap? I think you so. Didn't? Yeah. Um, what was what was his the, the 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 little kid? Right. You're talking about the little kid. When I first started the show, I was I first I had done something illegal and I was in in, in jail. And I remember that oh, I scene. Where I, was I was thinking of the older kids, or maybe they're not your kids, because I don't know one life to live. Jason, Shane, Scott, and Jessica Morris. I know where. No, they may not have been. 
They might have been. I just can't remember. Yeah, and I, I don't know the show well. One of the fans will tell me I'll I was probably wrong. <laughs> um, but seriously, for the past 21 years, you've been pursuing your passion of being on the stage. Um, where did that passion start? It actually started when I, I left One Life to Live. Um, uh, the the They brought in the old writers, the people who had, had written the show uh, a couple of decades before, and they brought them back and they got rid of Gary Tomlin's writers. And and, and G Gary was shown the door also. And these, these older writers who had written the show before had not written the character of Sam. So uh, they decided to write him out of the show. So I, I was, it was early spring 2003 when I knew I had about a month left on my contract and my agent said, listen, I got, uh, I've got a uh, audition for you. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's for uh, the, the play of the goat. And um, it's going to be, it's going to be in Vienna. And I said, Vienna, uh, Vienna, Virginia. <laughs> and she said, no, this is, they, they've actually got an English speaking theater in Vienna, Austria. And I said, you're kidding. He said, no, but if you want to go to this audition, you know, check it out. So I uh, got the sides, learned, learned my lines, and, and, and there was this humongous snowstorm hit New York. And my agent called me that morning and said, listen, everybody's booking, everybody's bailing, everybody's calling and canceling because they just can't get in. There was like two feet of snow that I dumped, I dumped the night before. And I was at the studio, and I had about a four-hour break before I was going to be needed on, on the studio floor. So I thought, well, what the heck, I'll, I'll go to this audition. And so I trudged down to the Ripley Greer Studios uh, around 38th and 8th Avenue and, and made, my, made my way to the, uh, the rehearsal audition area and uh, met Pam McKinnon and this casting director. And I did this, this um, audition. And, um, yeah, I did this audition. And the first thing I did was I pulled the, the, the chair that they had set up for the actor to sit in really close to the person who was uh, reading the, the, the assistant who was reading the other character. And I pulled the chair really close so we could have a, a, a very intimate, real conversation. You know, not not from where the, the chair the chair was originally far across the room. And for some reason, I got, this was theater, you know. So um, I got a call from my agent that, that afternoon saying, hey, they really, really liked the director really liked your performance, but she wants to know if you'd come back tomorrow and and do do the audition again. Um, and she needs to be convinced that you can actually speak loud enough for the audience to hear you. And I went, oh, I can do that. I, 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 can, I can speak louder. So when I got there the next day, I, the chair was set up in the middle of the space again. And this time, instead of pulling it close to the, the reader, I pulled it all the way to the far end of the room. And I had the conversation with her from the from the farthest distance away as, as I could be, and so I had to I had to speak up in order to communicate with this person across the room, and they were convinced. They said, "Oh, that's great. Okay, you're cast. You got it." So um, four days after my last uh, taping on One Life to Live, I was flying to Vienna, Austria, doing this lead, doing the lead role playing Martin in Edward Albee's The Goat, which had won the Pulitzer Prize and it won. Yeah. The best play on, you know. So it was quite the treat, and I, I was so used to um, learning lines, learning soap opera lines, you know, like anywhere from like one day it'd be five pages, the next day it'd be twenty pages, ten pages, you know, whatever. Uh, that uh, I, I I hadn't really looked at the script of the goat. So on the flight over to Vienna, I thought, well, maybe I should take a look at the script and see what we see what we got here. So I, I opened the first page, and there was Martin. He was on, he was on the first page. I went to the second page, and there was Martin again on the second page. Martin, Martin, Martin. Martin was on every single page of the script of The Goat, every single page. And I just went, oh, my God, I'm in trouble. I mean, I've got, I've got, we, we had, thank God we had four, four weeks of rehearsal. But <laughs> Every day I was like cramming my lines. You know, I thought I was really good at lines, but this this was this was <laughs> not every day. Yeah, like uh, Edward Al Alby, You know, ha had you done stage before? Oh, just meager little 
pity and you know, just just little things, not, nothing very serious at all. Um, so no, I was not a theater actor at all. But this was like my trial by fire. Uh, I, I you know got there and got to rehearsal, and I, I had script in hand for the first couple of weeks. And every night after rehearsal, I'd be walking the streets of Vienna, mumbling my lines out loud, trying not to bump into statues, you know. <laughs> And but I got it down. I got it down. And uh, incredible, had a, great, had a great time. It was eight weeks in Vienna, um, and I had never been to Vienna before. Or actually, I'd been to London, but no, but nothing else. And um, I just fell in love with Vienna. It was so. It's such a beautiful city. So beautiful. what what a great way to lose your job on one life to live, <laughs> and end oh, up yeah. in, and end up in Vienna. I mean, you know. I mean, it, it took the it took. I mean, there was a little bit of you know um, sadness about leaving one life to live. Yeah, it was, it was a good gig, and 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 I like the character, but um, to to get it replaced by doing an Edward Albee play in Vienna was quite the uh, the salve. And, and you haven't stopped doing stage no. since. No, no, not really. I mean, lately it's 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 been a little bit less than usual. But I had a, had a run there for quite a while, doing a lot of a lot of regional theater and some off Broadway shows. Do you have a so, favorite role to date? Um, well, gosh. Um, I did an off-Broadway play called um, Later Life by A.R. Gurney. Um, it was on Theater Row, and that was back in 2018. Um, A.R. Gurney is just a phenomenal writer. Uh, and he created a couple of really wonderful characters. Um, and and I played one of these characters, and it was it was just a gift to be able to deliver the the, the beauty of his his dialogue. Uh, okay. So that's one of them. Uh, but I also found out that I had a I had a um, a kind of an affinity for for comedy, which was kind of shocking. I didn't know, but I started somehow. I fell into doing a play. I did a play called Breaking Legs, uh, which turned out to be my first introduction to I did that in 2003 in Vienna again I got cast two years later to go back to Vienna because uh, that, that theater liked me so I, yeah they did I was just gonna did, say. did this did this farce in Vienna called breaking legs and it was hysterical I mean it was just bend over guffaw the audience were just loved it and I loved every minute of it and and so I came back to New York and and I did a play at the Cherry Lane Theater called Psychotherapy, which was another farce that was really fun. And then I hooked up with this director named Guy Stroman, who uh, directs, directed that out of the Mountain Playhouse in Pennsylvania. And uh, I, I, we, 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 we had a really good connection. And so he cast me in several of his plays. And most of them were, um, the, we began, began with Chapter 2, Neil Simon's Chapter 2. Which was a, a, oh, another. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah, it was so much fun to do, and then a several several farces after that. Really, I mean, just out, way out of left field, nutty, goofy farces. But but I loved every minute of the farce. I mean, farces, if they're done right, can be so so gratifying. I, I mm. did California Sweet in college, but I am uh, not an actor. <laughs> yeah, I, that's that's great. great. A great Neil Simon one for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Mitch Sandusky says hello, as does hey, Mitch. As does uh Nancy, Angela, and Jen said hi and they miss you. I don't know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um you just finished or are currently writing your first book, Running Naked. What can you tell us about it? Wow. And, and what prompted you to write something? Well, um, hold on. I am. Um, I just. It was during the the beginning of the pandemic, and I just had this bug to to write uh, about this this experience I had when I was a, a very young child, when I was about five or six. Uh, my my family had had they gave away my little brother Stephen to a family because he had severe case of cerebral palsy and and and. Uh, as much as my mother tried to um, fix him, you know, by moving his legs on the walking board and and moving his muscles and whatnot to try to build muscles, it was it was all to no avail. It was a, it was it was his his 
he was born normal, this this beautiful baby. But six months into his into his short life, um, he uh, he had a hernia, and he went into the hospital to have the hernia fixed. And this is back in 1959. They gave him too much anesthesia, and they burned his brain. They they, they destroyed his brain, and it was uh, it was irretrievable damage. It could not be could not be fixed. My mother tried for about a year and a half to two years to, to try to fix him on herself, and she just couldn't do it. So when he was two years old, they, my parents made the decision to give him to a family that, that could take care of him. And driving out there to, the, to, the, to this place, this house out in the, you know, out in, in the countryside, uh, it was a very solemn occasion. And... Um, Nothing was spoken in the car ride out there, and and Stephen was given away to this this older couple, and they 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 had two other babies that they were taking care of, so they, and they would have a total of three. And we got back in the car, and nobody said a thing. And I was just at that age, I was I think I was five or six. I I, I said to myself, well, five of us showed up at this house, and now we're leaving with only four of us. If this happens again, I'm going to be next. That was what I thought as a five-year-old, and I'll never forget the feeling of how it was. It was very scary. It was very emotional. So I just, I just, I wanted to write this story. So I wrote this story. It was. It's very short. It's about you know five pages. And then um, about a, after I finished that, I thought, well, I, there's another story I want to write. So I wrote another story, and then another story, and then I, then I was on a roll, and I ended up writing a total of thirty stories. Um, all chronically in the, this, this, the, the major events of my life that were, um, intense and, uh, extraordinary. Um, yeah, there's a, a lot of things took place. And so I put, put them all, put this, this, this trajectory of uh, short stories together. It's about 50,000 words and, um, and I get all of your life well History. most of it yeah most of it yes absolutely um so it, so I, I just I just i just kept writing and, and until i finished it to the i got to the point where i after the 30th short story i said that's enough and i i've received uh, i've received really positive feedback and, and encouragement from a lot of people that i respect highly and uh Next week, I meet with a couple of literary agents who are going to consider publishing my book. So I'm very, very excited and very grateful and very gratified that it's turned out to be this way. And so, yeah. Um, and and in some way, I mean, it's like honoring your brother, Stephen. Yes. Yes. That's a good, good way to look at it. Um, yeah. It, it was... Very tragic. He had a very tragic life, it's, and it was very difficult for my parents to deal with it. And um, it was unspoken for my for my my older brother Bill is two years older than me. For the two of us, it was there was unspoken, undealt with, unprocessed feelings about what had just happened. You know, you know, people in my generation anyway, there wasn't a whole lot of talking about deep feelings. You know, no, more I can't. I come from two Holocaust survivors, so oh my God. okay, you, you know, right, okay. and, and 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 I all, always say, you know, you know, we talk about mental health today. We need to talk about mental health even more. But you know, people go to therapy, people seek help. Back then, people, you know, my parents, your parents, people, you, you know, your parents should have given you help you know we need to know how to deal with these things yeah. as well because the the things that are happening to our parents affect us absolutely absolutely so it, it's i mean obviously we, we've made some progress in in uh, the, the the viability and and the, and the uh, value of discussing things that need to be discussed because sitting on them just doesn't do any good no, absolutely. And, right. And, and you just sharing this might help somebody, you know, I mean, there's Maybe. things, you know, I, 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 received, I received this one letter who said that 
um, from back in Oregon, which is where I grew up. She said that um, she had the exact same issue happen in her household. And she, believe it or not, her, her younger brother went to the same house. Uh, or just it just blew me away so yeah she said that was it was very very um powerful for her to hear somebody write about the exact same experience wow um have you thought about putting that into a short film just a, a little bit it's it's it would yeah, I mean, I, there's there's a number of the short stories in in the thirty that I have, that um, that that are viable for for making a short film out of, it. and that would, that's definitely one of them. There's um, I, I've I've made um, we just finished making another film. Yeah, uh, tell the long walk uh, home. It's it's called uh, Long Walk Home. And uh, it's it's based upon two of the stories, two of my thirty stories that I combined into this into this short screenplay. Um, and we are in post production right now. We're we're, trying, we're crossing our fingers that we can get this song from Bob Dylan to, to put to play in it. Wow, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be just amazing if we can do this uh, to get a Bob Dylan song. And, um, and based on a story from your life as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but. Um, yeah, so I, I combined two of the short stories and, and made this one short screenplay out of it, and I helped uh, produce it. I'm, I didn't act in it. I just I just helped produce it and, and wrote it. My dear friend Jeremy Fulmer directed it and did a fantastic job. And our other producer, uh, Dylan Blue, was uh, a magician getting all the logistics and everything um, in, in place. Um, so we're looking forward to completing it in the next couple of months and, and putting it as part of, you know, there's a fest, a short story festival circuit that goes around the country. Yeah. And we made a film two years ago called, uh, consider the sparrow, which we got, which was selected for 15 different, um, wow. um, short story wow. festivals. And, um, J Jeremy won a best actor. Uh, I won a best actor. Best, I won a Best Supporting Actor, as, and, and the other person in Consider This Barrel won Best Actress. Um, and we've had some. We've had some. Is that available to stream anywhere? Um, there's this thing called Film Freeway. Yeah, I think. I know, yeah, I, or Freeway Films, or <laughs> I'm terrible. Say the name at, of the short film again. Consider the Sparrow. It's 25 minutes long. Uh, and um, it's um, we're, we're very. It was our first attempt at making a short film, and we did a really good job. We won awards. I'm very I proud. Will of when I, I will look uh, okay. yeah. when, when we're off. I, I really hope Lawrence will come back when this book is published. And, I would and, love to come back when this when this book is published. Absolutely, I, I, I would love to read the book, and I, I can't even imagine what it was like for you to relive it while writing it because that's got to be kind of hard or cathartic at, at the same time i was just going to say uh it it turned out to be cathartic in in, in ways i i was unaware but it was it, all in all it was, it was a very healthy thing to very healthy endeavor uh sometimes very painful sometimes cheerful Sometimes um, there's a few moments of laughter. Um, yeah. So I would love for you to read it. Um, so yeah. we should we should stay in touch because I mean, there may Absolutely. be some, some Keep more urge, there may be some there may be some progress in that down the road recent, soon. Good. Well, keep yeah. me posted. I, I'm okay. so glad we spoke about it, and thank you for sharing that, and, and thank you for being here. It's great to oh, see you and pleasure, i know that the the fans you know uh from another world all my children to another world to one life to live to <laughs> as the world turns i mean the truly you know the power of daytime and i'm sure many of them here today have followed you from each of them thanks alan thanks very much have a great weekend you too we'll talk soon all right, all right. Uh, stay stay here for just a sec 
Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this Friday. Thank you to Lawrence Lau. Please join me next Wednesday, February 21st, when another All My Children alum, Jennifer Bassey, joins me live. And then on Thursday, February 22nd, join us for a Black History Month tribute to One Life to Live's Ellen Holly. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do so down below. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And if you liked today's episode, and I hope you did, please click the like button. And don't forget, you can stream audio versions by just searching The Locker Room on your favorite streaming platform. Have a great weekend, everybody. And as always, please stay safe.